going live. You're live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to the shop. Today, we are going to do the joinery window and this is a really fun project. Uh, this one we did about two years ago actually live here in the shop. And this was originally, uh, this is an old, old um, project and it could come with a bunch of different joints. But basically you have six different boards that then end up giving you nine different joints. So we're gonna be going through this and this is a, a great way to learn different joints and it comes all together and you glue it up. Uh, and it's a very, very fun project. And so I wanna do one of these every two years or so. It just gives a, a good thing to actually see how it comes together. And this is a fun one. I have a couple of people I know of that do it every year to kind of see how their skills progress and you can actually see how things get tighter and joints become a little bit better. Uh, so it's kind of fun to stack those up. Uh, so in this one, we've got set, we have, uh, nine different joints on this. Uh, so we've got, tonight we are doing the bridle joint, which is completely out of focus right here. Uh, it's to be not a bridle joint, a half lap joint. And the half, jab, half lap is about as simple as it gets. Uh, so you have half of a tenon on one side and the other half of the tenon on this side, the two of them sandwiched together and they go in. Um, in the future, we're going to be doing uh, this one, which is the bridle joint. Uh, and then we are going to be doing the mitre, oops, not that one, uh, where did it go? Mitered bridle joint. So it's a bridle joint. You can see it coming through here, but it ends up in a mitre. Uh, and then we have, this one is the uh, pegged tenon or a draw bore tenon. This one is, um, this is a, a through half lap. So it's a half lap on both sides and continues through the middle. Though I might do something different this time on this one. We have the regular tenon. Uh, so it goes into that, and I might do something different on that one because we have the drawboard tenon up here. Uh, this one is actually a pocket hole. <gasps> What's a pocket hole? Actually, a pocket hole is a very historical way of doing things. Um, it's very traditional. And then we've got the um, the dovetailed key, the, the dovetailed half lap. Um, and so this side it looks like a tenon joint, and this side it's a dovetail. So it's a, a fun mix of different joints to go together through it. Uh, so each week we will do one joint um, and it will take us more than nine weeks because we'll have other things that come into place. So if you want to build along with us, you can do so as well. You just need six pieces of wood that are basically identical. Uh, so I went to the store today and I bought a one by three made of red oak. Um, I figured I'd just go and buy one from the big box store and it makes it a little bit simpler so anyone can follow along with this. Uh, and normally, um, I would actually probably go and get something like pine. It would be a little easier. But today I went and I bought two boards. I bought the one by three out of oak, eight foot long. And I also bought a single one by four out of pine, eight foot long. And normally the oak is twice the price of the pine. And now the pine actually costs more than the oak. Uh, so um, you may want to do it out of oak because it's now the cheap wood. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, actually I, I was reading about a, a house um, in, I want to say it was in uh, Vermont that is actually being framed out of maple because it's cheaper to get maple two by fours than it is to get pine two by fours. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> prices are fun. Um, so these ones are 15 inches long. Uh, currently they are three quarter by two and a half. Uh, last time I did it, it was one foot by one foot and they were three quarter by two inch. Uh, so it really doesn't matter what size you get as long as they're all identical. Um, and I already cut them out to the same length. I planed them down to the same size. So these are all about as identical as you can get in size and shape. So we're going to set those aside and grab two of them because we're going to make this into the half lap joint. Um, any questions before I get going, babe? Anything I need to know? No, I was just thinking that it would be interesting in the future if I ever tried one. <laughs> So they can that might be fun in two years. When we do the next <laughs> one. Two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's something else I was going to say, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, no. oh. oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, for those of you, um, we're, once every six months or so, we do a live on the main channel um, on Saturdays. And rather than having a Saturday video, we just go and do a full live build. Um, so I do something that we take from beginning to end and finish. Um, so one of them was making a... Uh, uh, was it, a, it was a grooving plane, uh, molding plane. Another one we've made a mallet. Uh, and this time we're actually going to be making bow sanders. Um, and so we'll be doing a beginning to finish um, with what we have in the shop. So if you want to follow along with that, we're just going to be using some scrap wood 
and making one of these. And it's an incredibly useful tool. Um, I broke my last one, and so I need a new one. I make a good video on Saturday morning. So stay tuned for that. Uh, yeah, let's get into uh, working on this. So whenever you get into um, a joint, the very first thing you got to do is lay out. And I like to use a knife. It is far more accurate than a pencil. A pencil will leave a line that has a thickness to it. It doesn't matter how fine or acute your mechanical pencil is, there's still a thickness to that line. So are you cutting on one side or the other or right down the middle? Whereas a knife actually severs the fibers. Everything on this side, you go. Everything on this side, you keep. Um, so a knife is a, a great accurate way and it will increase the quality of your joints um, quite significantly. So I'm going to switch over to this camera so we can see what we got. First thing I want to do is I want to make a mark on this board, this distance in, the thickness of this. And then I want to make a mark on this side, this distance in, the thickness of this. Now I could come over here and I could set my marking gauge up to be at that thickness and then lock it down and make a mark here and make a mark here. But that's a, a secondary step. And every time you transfer to something else, you, you lose a little bit of accuracy. So in this case, I'm actually going to bring another stick over here, put it back that. I'm going to actually put this on here and I'm gonna square this up until the end feels good. And I'm going to register the flat side of my knife on here. And I'm just gonna make a slight nick there. Then I'm gonna take this, keep them together, flip it over, and I'm gonna do the exact same thing on this side. I'm going to flush up this, make them feel really, really good with my finger and just make a slight nick here. Now, why am I not going all the way across? Well, any minute change this way, even though it feels good here, may actually give me a bad line at that point. So now that I have that nicked there, I can bring in my square, put my knife in that line so the knife isn't moving, slide the square up against it, lock this down, and do a light pass, medium pass, and a hard pass. I'm going to do the same thing on this one, set the knife into the mark, Slide up against, light, medium, hard. And I do that in a series because if I do the hard one first, it's easy for the knife to wander as it will grab fibers and move around. Where it's, it's harder for the knife to wander if you're doing it with a light cut first. Now I could transfer these lines up around to the side, but first I actually want to make the mark running all the way around. Now, the interesting thing about this is because these two cuts, the line, you can't see them right now, but the line on both of these is on this side. Well, these are the opposite sides of the board because one of these needs to be turned around so that they lap together. So one of these is going to have the reference face on the back and the other one is going to have the reference face on the front. To keep track of those, we're going to use a little bit of masking tape. And I'm just going to put a piece of this on the reference face and eventually this will then be what I can mark the pieces with, with what joint they are, A to B, at this point, because I'm just putting two together. It really doesn't matter which ones are which. And I'll put this onto this board. This is going to tell me several things. Eventually, I'll be able to mark this board one, board two. But now I know this is my reference face. So any work that I'm doing, I'm doing off of this face. Um, and that way, I, I know that I can measure down from those. Just like if I'm working on this board, and I want to make marks into the middle of it, I want to measure down from the reference face. I don't want to re measure up on some and measure down on others. Because one of the things about wood is that wood moves. It flexes and it changes. And I may have gone through and planed all of these down to exactly the same thickness. These all came out of the same board. They should be exactly the same. But as I leave them out on the bench over the next day or so, they're all going to change slightly. And they may be down, you may be able to plane them down to one millionth of an inch accuracy. But over a few days, expansion and contraction, they may actually change by a few thousandth, maybe by as much as a hundredth. Um, expansion and contraction's a weird thing. So as long as you always measure from the same side over, you're always gonna get the same mark on every board. If you're ever measuring from one side on one and the other side on the other, those lines are gonna be moving around because the board thickness may change. So we want to make sure we have our reference face on both boards so we know what to come down from. Now the next thing I want to do is grab a marking gauge and we want to mark in halfway on this. So if you look on, oop, here's the other half lap. Focus. Is that really bright or is it just me? Mm, it's a little bright. Let me change that a little bit. 
There you go. There we go. It's a little dark. Why am I not seeing anything? There we go. And I'm not going to change that right now. Oh. Right. Uh, you just got real fuzzy. Did I? Yeah. That, that's better. There, there we go. So what we have here is I want to mark this line. So we're going to imagine this top face is our reference face. And I want to measure down where this line is. Now, theoretically, I want this line to be exactly in the middle of the board. But it really doesn't matter if it's exactly in the middle of the board or one way or the other. As long as I mark down from this face at that point, and on this board, I mark down from that same amount on this board, those two are going to match up. So that line doesn't have to be dead in the middle. It just feels nice to make it halfway dead in the middle. So to figure out where halfway dead in the middle is, I'm going to bring in this board. And I'm going to focus on you a little bit better. And I'm going to set my marking gauge mark right into about what looks like halfway. Slide the fence over and lock it down. I'm going to wiggle that pin in a little bit. And I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to see if those line up. And they're off by just a tiny bit. Maybe eh, somewhere around a hundredth of an inch. So I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to put that pin right in between those two marks. And now I know that if I draw this line and flip it over, this mark will be exactly the same line. So now that line is in the center of this board. However, this board may be changing. If I set it aside for a few days, its thickness is going to change ever so slightly. So I always want to make sure no matter what I do, I'm referencing off of this side of the board. So I want this to be on this side of the board. I do not ever want to put this on that side of the board and reference from this side. So we're going to start back here and we're going to mark three sides on this. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. Um, Alex asked, what about attaching actual glass? Is this easy to do? Uh, you could if you wanted to. Uh, these actually go by a bunch of different names over the years. The um, drainery window is just one that I kind of latched on because it looks like a window. Um, but this is fairly common for, um, for apprentices to actually do as a, as a, as a part of the, the procedures to be able to create something similar to this. And you'll see them with all sorts of different joints. Um, these are just the ones that I picked for the one I want to do. Again, I'm going to do this, keeping it on the reference side and go around from that. But uh, if you wanted to, you could rabbit them out, put in some glass and glaze it in. It might be kind of fun. Maybe do it so you could actually put uh, four pictures in there. See, now the real challenge would be to build this for Barbie Woodshop. All the different <laughs> joints. <laughs> yeah, Barbie, if you're watching. <laughs> that would be the challenge. <laughs> there. Now I've marked the stop cut here, and I marked all the way around that. Now we need to cut it out. Ah, cut it out. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, Probably one of the most common is to set up a bench hook. Actually, because I have two to do, let's do it two different ways. Uh, let me grab out bench hook. Slide that in there. And I can put this in. Because I have a hook, it allows me to stop and it holds it in place a little bit better. Focus on that. There we go. So with this, I'm going to be starting out here, and I'm going to be starting on the opposite side of the line. So the line's right here. I want to stay away from that line. And this one's been used a while. There's, there's a good bit of slop in here, so that hook, that line doesn't actually create anything. And I have two choices. Number one, I can go dead on that line if I trust myself. Or I can stay a little ways away from that line. Um, on one of these, I'm going to go dead on it and see how close I can get. And on the other one, I'm going to stay back a little ways so I can show you how to chisel back to it. So I'm going to go dead on with this one. And I'm starting on this side, and I'm going to slowly make the cut come back along that line so I can just focus on one spot on that line the whole way across. But everyone knows how incredibly difficult that really is to do it on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, before I go any farther, I need to have a line to follow. I don't need it on both sides. Now, also, this is my reference side. This is not my reference side, so I want my square to be on this side. I don't want to put it on this side. It shouldn't make much of any difference, but it's always best to reference your reference side. 
put your knife on that mark, slide it over. I just want to mark down to that halfway point. Don't need to go any farther than that. <laughs> and now we can cut. that halfway mark, check on the back, need a little bit more on the back. And just one more pass. And there we go. So I've cut down to the mark on there and this one is dead on the line. For the next one I'm actually going to do it in the bench vise. And this is usually how I like to do it. I, I don't know why, I just don't like pulling the bench hook out. I'd rather put it in the vise and hang off the side a bit I'm trying to figure it. out why I've never used that thing, or is it because none of my projects have been small enough yet to use it's that? It's because I'm teaching you, so you do it the way I do it. And then, oh, that, that's a very interesting fact. <laughs> um, there are a lot of traditions about this is the traditional way to do it. No, that's just where some master in the past decided he wanted to do it, and he taught his apprentice that this is the way you're going to do it because you are my apprentice. And when that apprentice became the master, he taught his apprentice and said, this is the way you're going to do it because this is the way I was taught to do it. And down through the years, that became tradition. Is that because it was the best way? No, it was because that master back then decided that's the way he's going to teach his apprentice. And over the years, traditions changed. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times when you hear someone, this is the best way to do it. Anytime you hear someone say, this is the best way to do it, understand that they're wrong. So are you trying to tell me you're teaching me the King James Version? Yes, yes. <laughs> KJV only around here. <laughs> so on this one, I'm going to put it in the vise. And I like this because it's open on the back. I can, I can just lean over and I can see it, or I could put a mirror back here and see it. Again, on this one, I'm going to stay a little ways away from the line so I can come back and trim it out. I'm just going to be a sixteenth or so away. And because I'm staying away from it, I really don't need to worry about vertical, so I'm not going to draw the line on this side. It's just not worth the time. What I can do is I can look in the reflection of the saw, and I can see the board continuing on into infinity. And so if I lean the saw one way or the other, you can see that reflection moving up and down. So what I can do is adjust that reflection until the reflection lines up with the board on the other side. And I know I'm cutting vertically then. To the line there, uh, yeah, good enough. So now we have both of these cut down with the shoulder. Now we, excuse me, with the cheek. Now we want to cut the shoulder down. Um, if, if you're ever wondering what is the shoulder and what is the tenon, or what is the the shoulder and the cheek? Imagine your body is a tenon. So you've got shoulders and you've got the thinner tenon. So if you have cheeks and shoulders, <laughs> so we're making half of a tenon. So we have the cheek and the shoulder. So that's half the song. Cheek, shoulders. <laughs> yes. Any questions while I set up this? Um, Mike, not Mike, Matt Groders asked if you take, oh, okay, if you take questions. Um, can I use my Milwaukee Fastback utility knife razor blade as my marking knife? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, just understand it has a bevel on both sides. So if you make the, the side of the steel flush up against the work, the actual cutting blade is going to be away from that because there's a bevel in between it. So you actually need to angle the knife so that the bevel is sitting up against the work. Um, and so that's one of the problems with having a blade that has a bevel on both sides. Um, a, a good marking knife in my book is flat on one side and only has the bevel on the other side. That way you can put the flat surface up against a surface you want to reference and make a line perfectly on that. So for this next step I'm going to grab a tenon saw. Uh, this is a carcass saw. It is not quite as tall. A tenon saw is much taller because it's designed to cut the cheeks of the tenon. It needs to go all the way down into it. Uh, it's also a rip saw because you're cutting with the grain. A carcass saw is a cross-cut saw because you're cutting across the grain. Now, on this one, I'm going to switch over here. We've got the tenon here. I need to cut all the way down to the depth here. And if I cut vertically like this, then I have to think about following the line on this side, on the top, and on this side. And I don't like doing that because I don't see the other side. What I want to do is I want to follow the line on the top and on the side that I can see. So I'm going to cut it at an angle 
down like this. And then I'll turn the board around, and then I can cut the angle the other way, and then follow it down. And that just makes it a little bit easier to follow that line. So I'm going to start on the far side. I'm going to pinch the board so that it can slide up against my thumbnail. It allows me to accurately move the saw side to side. Just start a few nicks over here. This one I'm going to put right into that marking, right into that line. And again, I'm going to let it follow all the way across so that I can see as it's cutting into it across the board and stay right on that line. Now I have a nice established line across there. I'm going to start lowering my hand and coming back across. I'm actually back this up just a hair. Focus on my hand. There we go. And that way you can see me starting to lower across this way. And I'm going to eyeball this line coming down. This saw is tight. I need to loosen it up a bit. Where'd my wax go? There it is. So I use a little bit of my hard wax. Once again, something James won't let you use if he's actually teaching you in the shop. Well, <laughs> and this will have to slide much easier. All right, now I'm at a corner from corner to corner. Pull it out, rotate it around. And now I have the, the line established on the top. You can see this board is actually pinching up on it. The kerf on the top is a lot smaller. And then I can follow the line down this side without having to worry about the other side. Okay, let me show you a little close up on this. Sorry if it moves around. Focus. There we go. Let me see if I can get this a little closer for you. It would be nice to have a camera guy. So I'm going to follow that line down. Whoa. What? I just realized that you changed the camera. I'm going to cut right on that line, right down to that point. So now that that has happened, now we're at our diagonal this way. I'm going to set the saw over and we'll cut that right down. It's got a kerf on both sides to hold it in place. Ooh, almost there. One more. There we go. And let's take a look at how clean or not so clean that cut is. That's pretty decent. I'll take that. So this is the one we need to clean up the shoulder. So now we're going to repeat and do the same thing on this one. Any questions why I set that one up? Uh, let's see. One year 713s. First time catching a live stream. New a follower. Where did you learn your craft and did you start with cheap tools? Yes. Um, well, woodworking I've been doing since I was five. I followed my father along in the wood shop. Um, however, hand tools is a bit of a new thing for me. Um, it was about five years ago I started doing all hand tools. Um, and when I started with that, it was a cheap plastic saw that I got for free, um, a set of Harbor Freight chisels, um, a mallet, actually this cheap dumb mallet, and a uh, number four hand plane that I restored. I spent a total of $12 and I started woodworking with that. So, yeah, um, if you ever want to see it, Wood by Right uh, is the total journey of all my hand tools. So you go back and watch my oldest video on Wood by Right, um, and it's, hey look, I just bought a hand plane. This is the first hand plane I've ever used. Um, that was my journey. Uh, so from there on is where I'm at. So if you actually want to see the full journey, there it is. It's a lot of videos. It's almost 2,000 videos right now. So um, it is Be careful, quite the... they multiply the tools. They're yes. like rabbits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So let's do the same thing on this one. Oop, almost cut on the wrong side of the line. Oof. I start 
started off a little bit, so I had to try and for force it over. What I'll do is sometimes is, let me show you from this angle, um, i got to adjust that a little bit, is if, if your saw is off your mark a little bit and you need it to move one way side to side, rather than trying to push the saw over, lean the saw in the direction you want it to go, and then cut back that way at a very steep angle, and then you can bring it into vertical to put it where you want it to be. And so you can actually move it by the direction that your saw is forcing. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> but I was a little bit off my line and I wanted to go back over, so I just leaned the saw over so it cut back in the direction I wanted to go. Now I have a nice kerf right where I want it to be. Let's cut down this way. Come back on that line. If you, ever, if you ever start to go off the line, don't try and correct the line. Back up, twist the saw, use the set, the set of the teeth. So use the side of it as a file to clean up that line and get it back on course. Don't try and correct the cut. Go back and actually put it back where it's supposed to be. up already. So you can see how it's rubbed off some of the wax because this board is actually squeezing in on the work. So here I've worn off this wax already. So I'm just going to put a little bit more on there. Makes it cut so much easier. That's what I get for using the cheapest lumber in the store. <laughs> that cut. I'll come in here so you can see this piece fall off. As long as I can focus. Camera's having issues tonight. There you go. To the cut there. I need a little more on the back side. the cut. What is wrong? Oh, this cut didn't come all the way through. So you need to back up. I'm going to pinch the top. Pinching the top allows this gap to open up a little bit. So it's not going to pinch on the saw. There. Now I can cut all the way down. Ta-da! Piece come off. So now we can see. Yeah, this came out pretty well. And what I want is I want this to be sticking out just a little bit more than this. I want a little bit of a step there so that I can come back and plane this surface down. Same thing on the other side. I want there just to be a bit of a bump to do that. So what questions do we have while I change that around? Um. Trusty Rusty asks, how come my brand new Veritas crosscut saw that was recommended by every YouTuber is the slowest cutting saw I have? Um, don't know. The How a saw works has nothing to do with the saw. It's just to do with the last filing on it. So it depends on who is the last person to sharpen it. So um, yeah, that's going to be wildly different. And with Veritas... And most saws under $300, the last person to sharpen them was a machine. Uh, they're not actually hand sharpened. Um, so sharpen it and it'll cut faster. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's clean up this one. This is the one that I cut directly to the line. And I'm going to grab a three-quarter inch chisel. Make sure. Yep, that's good. And we are going to just do a little detail work on this because there's a little bits and snots that get in there. There we go. And we've got this edge where 
uh, the, the saw didn't cut all the way in. So I'm going to use this as a knife and just score that and then come in this way. Normally I'm going to come in from the end, but with the camera there it's a little hard. Actually, I can do it that way. I'm just getting rid of that little bit of fuzz right up in that corner. So we're getting a nice tight corner there. And then I'm just going to look and see there's a little bit of the extra here. And that's pretty much ready to go. I can set the, set the edge of the chisel on there and see where it's high or where it's low. But in this case, that's actually right about where I want it. Uh, there's a couple different ways of cleaning up this surface. If this isn't perfectly flat, which in this case, that's good and ready to go. Now that I've gotten rid of that junk in the corner, this is, wow. That, that, uh, that, that does not happen most of the time. Um, that is wildly good. <laughs> that, that's if not I normal, do so don't worry so about myself. it. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then when you're doing something live, it actually works out and then uh, you don't know what to do with your time. <laughs> okay, so this face and this face are the right thickness. I'm gonna have to clean up this edge in here a little bit more here in a moment. But uh, normally, I'm going to have to take off a little material on this. And so I can come into the shoulder plane or something of that nature. And this allows me to get right up against the shoulder, thus a shoulder plane. And I could do the actual shoulder itself like that. Um, or if you're having a little bit of issue with the shoulder, you can come in and undercut it, which I'm going to do on the other side. On this one, that's good. Um, so if you just come in and do the shoulder, then you can come in after that with a regular bench plane because the shoulder is taken care of straight across, now I can come into the bench plane and clean up across the work that way and flatten it out with the bench plane. Um, and if you don't have, back up there, if you don't have a shoulder plane, then you can always come in with a chisel and freehand it across there until the chisel touches all the way across. And then you can come into the plane and do the majority of the surface. So you don't have to have a dedicated shoulder plane to do this. Um, a bench plane and a regular chisel is all you really need. So this one is good to go. The other one though, that is the one that I cut away from the line and it actually needs a little bit of work on it. Um, for this one, I'm actually going to lock it in a little bit tighter here. Any questions while I'm setting this up? Sorry, hang on. I thought I was going to sneeze. I have that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. So then I, you can bless me. Um, uh, let's see. One of your asks. I have noticed wooden planes run cheaper than most metal planes. Would getting a wooden plane be a good idea? Um, yes and no. A wooden, wooden plane will treat you very well. A wooden plane is a great project. The problem with wooden planes is they take a little bit more skill. Um, they're a little bit more finicky to adjust. Um, and it doesn't mean they work any less. It doesn't make them make any worse. It's just they require more skill to use. So if you're first getting started, you're going to get very frustrated because it takes a lot of skill to set up a, a wooden plane and, and keep it going right. The nice thing about a metal plane is it's a lot easier to adjust. There's a knob and a movement for everything. Um, the, the sole stays relatively flat for years, um, so you don't have to worry about it that much. Uh, whereas a wooden plane, they take a little more maintenance, they take a little more care, uh, but they work just fine. So. Um, um, this one. So on this one, we're away from that line. So in this case, normally I would split the difference and come back about halfway, but I am pretty darn close. I don't think I can split that halfway again. No. Nope, I'm not going to be able to get that halfway back. So I'm actually just going to chisel it by hand, or um, right into the line. So I'm going to stay away from the outside edge. I don't want this hanging over the edge. I don't want it right on the edge. I'm actually going to come in about an eighth inch away from that edge. And I'm going to make a lot of noise and chisel that right down. Slide over a little bit more. Right down, slide over a little more. And then in this one, I'm not going to go over the edge. I'm going to leave about an eighth inch on the outside. And 
And the reason I'm leaving that eighth inch is that it really doesn't matter what I do here in the middle. If I mess up here in the middle, not a problem. If I want to undercut and I want to cut back into that, not a problem. But this outside edge, that's the important part. That's the part that gets seen. So on this side, now I'm going to take my time and be very, very accurate. Make sure I'm good and vertical. I'm going to clean that down. Do the same thing on this side. Make sure I'm ver vertical. Cut straight down. Now that we've cut in there, we can come back and remove this dross from where the two chisel, the two saws touched. Touched by a saw. Sounds like a horror story. And remove that out. And just like that, let's see how does this fit. So now what I want to do is I want to make sure, number one, that this is flush here. That tells me that the thickness of this surface is right. Number two, I want to push it up against there. And I want to make sure that this outside here is flush. And I want to make sure that I don't have any gap here. And you, hear, you see I have a bit of a gap there. And lo and behold, it's not flush on the outside here. So that means that something is pushing it away. And I want to see where is it being, okay, it's, like it's rocking a little bit in the middle. So there's, there's something in here in the middle holding it out. And see, I can push it tight here, and I can push it tight there. So I don't want to touch anything out there. I just want to clean out in the middle. Something is pushing it out right here in the middle. And looking at it, yeah, I can see. Um, at some point here in the middle, my chisel leaned away from the shoulder. So I'm actually going to come in here in the middle and just undercut it a little bit. And that's why I like doing it straight off the saw, if possible. Let's see what we got now. Yeah, see, that's a lot better. Nice tight joint all the way across there. Flush on the back here. Pushing this that way. Flush on the outside there. Let's flip it over. That looks pretty darn decent. I like that. It's not quite perfectly flush here. Just to my finger, this is a little bit off. So what I'm going to do is try one more thing. And I'm going to push this shoulder down, this shoulder down, just a hair. And for that, I'm going to use my shoulder plane. And I'm actually going to do a shoulder with my shoulder plane. Except it's taking too thick of a shaving, so let's back it off a hair. I'll back it off until it doesn't take a cut. Right there. Almost. There, just a hair that way. Turn it around. Just a hair that way. And we can check it again. That's what I'm looking for. Nice and flush on top. Nice tight joint. That will glue up beautifully. So that is a half lap. Just like that. Beautiful. What's that? The beautiful. So one of nine joints to be done. Uh, next time we are going to do the bridal joint. Spelled like anything in woodworking, not like bridal. But like bridal. Good thing bridal spelled two different ways. No, not like bridal, but like bridal. I know. <laughs> you have a super chat you need to acknowledge. Oh, do we? What do we have? Kenny and Janet Horn says super chat for thank you to James and Sarah. Oh, thank you, man. Do you have a mom joke ready or is there a question um, I can answer or you're looking? I'm going to give, no, I don't even have a question to give you. Hang on. If anyone has questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, if there's something you want to see, let me know. We actually have a decent amount of time left, so we can get to that. The nice thing about a half lap is it's a really quick joint to make. Um, and contrary to popular belief, a, a, uh, the half lap is a very strong joint. Um, it is not constrained. So in other words, it has three different directions it can come apart in. 
However, with a decent glue, that is an incredibly strong joint that will last a long, long time. You put a pin in it, and then that constrains it in all but one direction, um, the strongest of the three directions. So it, it is a very, very viable joint for a lot of different things. And for how easy it is, it's a great so joint. So what if you side by side that one and your other one? Is there a difference? Oh, yeah, it'd be a good one. Do you have a mom joke? Yes. What have we got? Do you know what my friend named um, her son after she delivered him on the way to the hospital? What? Carson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's see. It's always going to be that way, isn't it? Yep, right. So this one is reverse of what I did the last time. So, yeah, let's actually take a look at how these came out. Now, the finished joint on the new one won't match this one. Because one of the interesting things about this project is when you have all nine joints done, then you have to glue it up. And if there's a problem with one joint that isn't perfect, it'll push another one slightly out. And that pushes another one even farther out, and it's a compounding error. So any small error in this will show up big time, especially when you get to the last joint, which in this case was the spline joint. Um, and the spline joint on mine from two years ago is pretty hideous. Uh, you can see that right there. And that is the culmination of small error after small error after small error after small area. These two corners just didn't meet together perfectly. Um, and so on this one, I mean, that joint is just about as good and tight as they can get. Uh, but it's not glued up and it's not constrained. So this is, and it hasn't been dropped on the floor yet. Uh, so this one, with the glue, you can see there's a bit more. Let me see if I can zoom in a little better. Whoa. Focus. You can see there's a, a decent gap here um, on the outside face. We're pretty tight here, and we're pretty tight here. On this one, you can see the opposite crack. It's getting wider over here. So these two were split slightly more like that. So this one is actually pretty close to just about as tight as the new one came out. Um, but the cracks show up because there is a slight flaw somewhere else in the joint that caused these to then crack like this. And once they start to turn out, you get a big crack here and a bigger crack on the inside there. So one of the fun things about this is it, it's, this is a great project to improve your accuracy. Um, it's not a fantastic project for learning joints because you're only gonna be doing one of each joint, but it is a great project for learning layout and being far more precise and accurate because the, the thickness of a mechanical pencil line will cause you all sorts of problems in this. It's one of those things that you have to be very, very accurate to get this looking good. But it's a great way to show, um, to show that and actually walk you through it. So good, fun project. What questions we got? Let's see, Brian Mulligan asked, besides glue, would you add a fastener? No, no. Um, well, I mean, de depending upon the, the, the methodology, very rarely are metal fasteners actually adding to the strength of the joint. Uh, that, is, that is a very rare, rare thing. Most of the time, metal fasteners are just there to hold it together until the glue dries. Once the glue dries, the glue is what's holding it. The metal fasteners are just there. Um, the, the changes to that are anything that requires movement, such as a hinge um, or a pin of that nature. Um, or um, a pocket hole, but a pocket hole, there's no glue. It's just the screw holding it together. Um, so no, I would not use a metal fastener. Um, glue is an incredibly strong joint. Um, as, as a side to this, biscuits do not strengthen a joint. So you take two boards and you joint them together and you put biscuits in it. Biscuits do not strengthen that joint. In actuality, the biscuits weaken the joint, and that's very counterintuitive. The problem is biscuits aren't clamped in there, and a PVA glue requires a lot of clamping pressure to work correctly. And you have a void in there that doesn't have clamping pressure on it. And so that's a small portion of the board that doesn't have the full force of the glue. Biscuits are there to fix alignment. See, normally, uh, historically, if you needed to join two boards together, you left them rough, you joint them together, and then you plane the whole thing flat. 
And that way you don't have to worry about making them perfect. You can just fix whatever's left over afterwards. However, with the advent of power tools, you have to run them through a thickness planer. And your thickness planer is only so wide. And if you want a board that's wider than your thickness planer, you have to thickness plane them first and then glue them up. And if they're off any amount, it's a horrible pain to straighten out and fix. And so biscuits are in there to provide that alignment and help fix that, that alleviation. They're not there to strengthen the joint. Um, so yes, um, things that go in the joint rarely strengthen the joint. They will just constrain its movement um, during glue up or any uh, future movements. Um, but putting things into it almost always weakens the joint. The simpler the joint is, the stronger it is in most cases. What's next? Let's see. Ronald White asks about how thick a shaving should you aim to get on a block plane? Depends on the use. Uh, if I'm doing chamfers, uh, I may end up taking a pretty heavy shaving, like uh, maybe five hundredths. Um, really, really heavy shaving. Actually, more than that in case, in some cases, um, because I'm just I'm taking off a small wide uh, amount. Now, if the wood gets difficult, then I may end up having to back it down and taking a thinner shaving. Um, but if I'm using it for doing end grain, then I want really fine shaving um, because you're putting a lot of force into it and cutting end grain requires a decent amount of force. Um, and so in that case, I'm probably going to be taking it down to two or three thousandths, um, something very, very thin. So it just depends on the use. Um, very few of my planes are ever set up at the same depth thickness, with the exception of my smoothing plane that is dedicated and set up to fine smoothing um, with a high angle for, I can, I can smooth just about anything with that. And so I keep that very, very finely tuned. Everything else, the depth will change over use. And I'll start by doing a very heavy cut, and then I'll back it down and take my last few shavings a little bit thinner. Um, that's a, a pretty common way, even with a block plane. There's a knob on it to make it adjustable pretty easily. What's next? Yeah, one second. Oh, I lost that. She's hitting buttons. I know. Uh, let's see, Jesse Grossens asked, what is the easiest joint to hide movement? <laughs> um, a pocket hole. You can suck it tight with a screw. Um, yeah, if you're talking about like movement as in the, the glue up, which one is the easiest? Uh, probably the dovetail because it naturally constrains itself. It will lock itself down into the position. Um, draw bores are very good because it will pull it down into the position. If it's out of position, that, that pin will suck it down in. Um, but yeah, if you're actually talking about um, the wood will be moving and you want the joint to move with the wood, it really depends on the position. Uh, pocket holes are actually very good for that. Um, or you could be talking about um, a, a loose tenon. Um, so it's glued in one point, but the rest of the tenon is loose so that it can move around. Um, best example of that is a breadboard end. You know, breadboard end on the end of your table, it's very wide. It's only glued in the middle so that the, 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 the table can expand and contract, but the end board can't expand and contract. Wood doesn't expand and contract lengthwise. It just expands and contracts widthwise, radially. Um, and so the, the table will be able to expand and contract and those tenons in that joint can then slide as the, 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 the table expands and contracts. Is that a super chat I saw? It is. Tom, Tom said, thank you, man. So would you feel safe using your basement clad in tools as a tornado shelter? My wife worries about ours. <laughs> I would. Um, yeah, I would. I mean, there's no windows. Yeah, there's no windows. We have, we, I have concrete on I was three like, walls. It probably this is, is probably the safest, the safest spot. place. <laughs> These concrete walls are not going to shake from a tornado. Um, I just, I wouldn't stand underneath my clamps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, probably the, sh the shop would be the safest place in our house for a tornado. There, there is one. One window, but it's actually concreted in. It broke at some point, and a previous owner filled it in with concrete. <laughs> What's the mom joke? Uh, let's see. Uh, 
My mate was telling me he failed his exam in Aboriginal music. I asked, did you redo it? (laughs) 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 I like it. (laughs) Anything with a degree, do you like? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) What's next? Oh, hang on. I got to figure out where I am now. (laughs) Uh, Michael Curry asks, I usually plane the final thickness after all the joints are together. Do you do that or do you pre-thickness and trust your joinery skills? Yes. Um, normally, like if I'm doing dovetails, I'll leave a little, I made the board just a hair longer than it needs to be. So it's sticking out, you know, a few, maybe a hundredth at most. Um, and so I can plane everything off nice and smooth. And yes, that is one of the things on this is um, the outside joints are left just a hair long. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to do that with this. I'm actually going to finish them out and, because this is a this is a test of skill, and so rather than finishing them and planing them, I'm going to leave them as flush as I can possibly make them. Right now, they they feel nice and flush. Uh, but if I really wanted to come in and clean them out, I could come into the plane and plane off the outside and take them down to the same thickness. Um, yes, most of the time when I'm doing work, I, I leave the boards just a little bit bigger so I can plane them down after the fact, if there is the space to plane them down. Um, dovetails are a great instance of that. What's next? Yeah, we've had several come through. I'm not sure we're going to get to them all. Okay. Um, Nine minutes left, so we'll see what we can get. Michael C. wants to know if you'd throw a square on it and see if it's 90 degrees. Uh, sure. It's going to be hard because it, it, I know, well, it's me lock it together. Glue. Let's put the square on it. So I'm not going to do it yet. I'll put it out here so everyone can see. Make sure. Actually, let me go ahead and clamp this together so that I'm not wiggling it. So I'll throw the hand clamp on. Oh, Tom wants to know, is the super chat light not turned on? Um, no, I have to refix the smart house on that. Got to fix it. So lock those together as if it's being clamped, as being clamped as if it's being glued. All right, let's see what we get here. So switch over to this one. So that is all clamped in place. Let's see how close does this get. That is well within tolerance. It is ever so slightly, I'd say if anything, it is a uh, what's it, obtuse by, I don't think I see anything in there. If, if it's out, it's out by like a hundredth of a degree. It's well within the flexibility of wood, so that's actually <laughs> pretty happy. Man, yeah, here. Let's see if I can show you that. Put some light oh, behind it. Blinding. Slide it down so you can see the gap disappear uniformly as it slides up. That's actually really happy. So yes, 90 degrees. <laughs> uh, Nick Clickner asked, would a wooden dowel in the middle of the half lap add any strength? Yeah, it, what it would do is it constrains the joint so that it can only move in one direction, in the direction of the, uh, the dowel. Um, yes. Yeah, well, it, it, it depends on the application of the joint and what direction will the stresses be coming from. Uh, if the stresses are pulling that joint apart this way, then yes, putting a dowel through it will stop the joint from coming apart this way. Um, if the stress is the joint coming apart this way, then no, the dowel isn't going to add any strength to it at all. Um, so as with anything, you have to look at the joint not as a standalone joint, but in the application of the whole project. Which way will forces be going on this? Uh, Which way will the kids be running into that dresser? Uh, That's one of the things you have to think about is (laughs) which which direction is it coming from? (laughs) We know it really runs into things. Uh, Although you hit the the microwave, the microphone the other day. That was this morning. Was it this morning? Yeah. Oh, it's been a long day. 
Uh, I thought it was Saturday. <laughs> uh, let's see. Richie Cole. Do we know when the next Midwest Tool Collectors event will be? Um, as of right now, the National in June is still on, and that is in Madison, Wisconsin. So I'm really hoping that one comes through. Because <clears throat> that's only an hour away from me, so I will definitely be there. Um, and it, it's looking pretty likely. Um, they'll probably be doing some modifications to it. They will. Um, one of the thoughts was to actually put up a tent um, rather than having the the main indoor event happening indoors, having it outside. Um, normally, the tailgate on Thursday is one of the best sales ever um, because you get a lot of guys who bring up the really rusty things that need to be restored, but the collectors don't want. And you'll have, you know, Joe Schmo with a truck full of tools. I'll put it out on tails in the back of the truck and, and uh, make me an offer type stuff, and it's really good deals. Uh, it's one of my favorite sales. And if you have daughters and you've <laughs> taught them woodworking, take them with you. Yeah, walk around with the kids. All the, 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 the old guys are like, oh, give the kids free tools. <laughs> My favorite story is when someone asked Melody, was it a, was it a dog? For a, a bench dog? When he asked her what it was and she actually knew the answer and so he gave her a tool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, my first ever uh, MWTCA national that I went to, um, one of the guys I was becoming friends with and he's like, I've got something for you. And he ran out to the truck and he brought this. That's a flat blade screwdriver. I have no idea what I would ever do with this, but someday there's going to be a screw way back in there that I can't get to, and this will be useful. And so he, he couldn't find anyone to sell it to, and he's like, oh, you want it? I'm like, no, but yes, I do. <laughs> you know, if you modify it, it'd be a great back scratcher. Yeah, yeah. What's the next question? So the dates, it's June 16th through the 19th, correct? Because that's uh, what's that being right, posted. Yeah. I say, are... Mel's birthday is the 16th, and I remember it was around the same time. So, all right, Lynx GS, listening to you about biscuits, how would you go about adding, say, oh, we just talked about dowel strengthening. Never mind. Well, dowels to a joint, uh, to a jointed board, Yeah. those won't add any strength to okay. it. Okay. Um, because it's the same problem with a the biscuit. There, there isn't any clamping pressure to hold it in place. Um, surprisingly, just jointing a board and gluing it together is an incredibly strong joint. That glue will hold everything. My table upstairs, it's 600 pounds, um, and the whole top is just two big slabs glued together, nothing, nothing attaching them other than glue. It is completely strong. Uh, we'll get the whole family up there and dancing on it and never have a problem. Um, a, a solidly glued joint with proper pressure is all you need. Um, other things... Dominoes, biscuits, dowels, splines, they're not necessary. Um, the only time you'd need those is if you are working with an inferior glue or if you're not going to be gluing the joint and you still want to constrain its movement. And there are applications for not gluing the joint. So, yeah. Which I, I did it actually on a side table not too long ago. One year asked, how often do you sharpen a plain blade? Depends on its use. It uh, depends on the iron, depends on the thickness of the cut, depends on the wood. Uh, it's one of those things that's, it's really hard to. And a scrub plane, it's once a year. You can let a scrub plane get really, really dull before you have to get at it. Unless, unless you're doing something really nice, you want to clean it up. Um, with my smoothing plane, really well set up on a difficult piece of wood, I'll stop and sharpen that thing every five to ten minutes. Um, a jointer, when I actually use them for jointing, twice a year maybe. Um, you know, a number five that I have on the bench all the time, every 30, 40 minutes worth of solid planing. Um, so it really depend, depends on so many different things. Is that a super chat? It is. Tom, Tom wants, thanks, man. Wants to know about Knights of the White Oak meetup at the show and then in the BLO Kool Aid Fest. <laughs> yes, uh, if it happens, we will most definitely be doing a meetup at the MWTCA. Um, that will be a, uh, yeah, we'll do something. Don't know where, um, but yeah. Actually, my master's was in UW-Madison, so I, I know the place well. Let's see. 
Um, Jesse Grossens asks, I bought and built the frame saw. I find it drifts a lot. Any suggestions? Yeah. Do you have a mom joke for Tom? Or I'll oh, answer this I later. will find one um, when I did that. Yes. The, one of the biggest problems with the frame saw is you really got to crank that thing down. Put a lot of pressure on it. It's a big blade. You can put a ton of pressure on that before you are running into any problem. Usually I'm sticking a screwdriver in there. I'm putting my whole body into it and cranking it around. Um, if uh, about all the force I can put onto it, about six inches out, is the, the, the force I'm putting into to cranking that thing down. The tighter you get it, the less it's going to be flexing when you're pushing or pulling on it. Um, now, if it's always veering off to the same direction every time, then you're going to need to stone the saw. There's too much set on one side of the blade. So look up a video on how to stone a saw, um, and I talk you through that, and that actually will take the set off of one side so that it will track correctly. Um, so if, it, if it's veering off all over the place, um, or if it's on the line on your side and on the line on the other side, but then you open up the board and it's cupped out on the inside, that's usually because the blade is not tight enough. So what's the mom joke? Found out all four of my sons want to be ballets when they grow up. The doctor says it's the worst case of Parkinson's disease he's ever heard of. <laughs> he gets <laughs> likes it, likes it a lot. Ah, uh, you want to do one more question? I have two more. Can two I sneak more. Sneak them in. Oh, we're gonna stretch it out. Okay. Word work learner asked, "Will the glue alter the joint in any way, such as um, during expansion?" Um, not if it's clamped down correctly. No. Um, there, a lot of people worry about starving the joint by putting too much pressure on it. Uh, with PVA glues, you can't do that. You should squeeze it with all your might. Um, you can't really starve the joint. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it really comes down to squeezing out all the excess so you don't have any voids. But no, they, they, they should not cause any deviation of wood movement. All right, last one. The alchemist asked, I'm building a pine workbench. Do you think there would be any, would it be any good to compress the wood around the mortise with a hammer? Uh, if you want to, one of the problems with pine, especially if you're building it out of two by fours and construction lumber, um, and especially if you're doing it in an air conditioned shop, it will take it another year or so or more for that wood to fully dry out. And so that wood is going to shrink um, a good bit. And in which case then yes, compressing it with a hammer first and getting it in there um, could be very beneficial. Um, if the wood is fully dry and cured, no, uh, it's really not going to cause that much of a difference. Um, so. Although there are a lot of people out there who will argue, yes, it does add so much more because it adds clamping pressure. Well, it only adds clamping pressure after the glue has cured because the, the time it causes for that to rebound is, is quite long. So I, personally, I wouldn't do it um, unless I'm worried about there still being some moisture in the wood and the wood's going to shrink in the future. So. Good time. Um, next week, we are going to be doing the bridal joint um, and going on from there. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, I think that'll do it. Anything for you? Nope. I was just making sure it wasn't working next week, and I'm not. Ah, At least good. not on Tuesday. <laughs> so uh, that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.